Hi, everyone, and welcome to the analysis seminar, uh, the first hybrid version. We're happy to have Alvaro Romaniega from the Instituto de Ciencias Matemáticas, who will tell us about nodal sets of monochromatic waves from a deterministic and random point of view. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, the organizers for uh, of the seminar. And I would also like to thank Joseph for hosting my stay here at CRM in, in Montreal. So uh, today we are going to talk about uh, nodal sets um, of monochromatic waves. And we are going to do so from a deterministic and a random uh, perspective. So, is there a way to remove this? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. And we don't see it from the screen, so you can keep going. Yeah, but yeah, I can. I cannot like yeah, yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah. Just a second, we're having a technical issue. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. Okay. Thank you. Um, so first of all, uh, we start with a definition. What are monochromatic waves? So for us, monochromatic waves are solution to the Henkel equation with a fixed eigenvalue and they are solutions on the whole Euclidean space. And as we know, the Henkel equation is a very important equation in theoretical physics. It appears in thermodynamics, electromagnetic theory, quantum mechanics. Um, in order to obtain information about the function, what we can do is to try to understand the nodal set because the nodal set and the zero level set is like the, the skeleton of the function. Uh, that was uh, for monochromatic waves, but how do we define random monochromatic waves? So we know that if we have a um, solution to the Hinkle equation that is um, a temper distribution, for instance, for instance, if it is polynomially bounded, then the Fourier transform is supported on the unit sphere. So uh, we're gonna start on the sphere and we start with a random distribution on the sphere, which is going to be a series and a combination of uh, random coefficient and spherical harmonics. And these random coefficients are independent, identically distributed Gaussians with zero mean and variance one. So once we have that on the sphere, what we do is to uh, go to the Euclidean space taking the Fourier transform. And that's equivalent to say that our monochromatic random wave is going to be a series of random coefficients, spherical harmonics, and spherical Bessel functions. In fact, this is quite general because any monochromatic wave, not necessarily polynomially bounded, can be approximated on compact sets and uh, also der with derivatives. So taking a truncation and appropriate coefficients. So this is like a general uh, definition. And now the question is, what do we know about um, monochromatic random waves um, and, and the nodal set? So here, n, depending on u and r, uh, denotes the number of connected components of the zero set that are contained in the ball of radius r. So what Nazarov and Sodin proved is that there is a positive constant such that the number of connected components grows volumetrically. And that happens almost surely um, uh, with probability one. And that quotient goes to the same constant, the Nazarov Sodin constant. And later, this was uh, refined by Sarnak and Wickman. And they proved that if you, instead of counting every connected component, you just count the ones that are diffeomorphic to a given hypersurface, that is smooth, close, and rentable, then you are going to get the same result. There is a positive constant such that that limit uh, goes to, uh, to the Nazarov solving constant, and that happens almost surely or with probability one. Uh, to understand some properties of monochromatic waves, let's define a more general version of, of them. So here we are going to introduce a parameter S and that parameter is inside the new term that is L to the power of minus S. 
that has the effect or that's equivalent to say that now instead of considering that variances are uh, one and constant, now the variances uh, depend on L and the growth or the decay changes with X, with S. So um, what happens if we do that? So uh, one can prove, uh, well, this is going to be a joint work with Alberto Enciso and Daniel Peralta Salas, is that the regularity, because monochromatic waves, random monochromatic waves are always analytic, but the regularity on the sphere is not always known. So the parameter S controls the regularity on the sphere. And you can prove that the larger the parameter S, the smoother the, the distribution on the sphere because it's going to be in a higher uh, sub-level space. Okay, um, what's, why is that relevant? Well, there is a, a strong connection between the regularity of, on the sphere and the decay properties of the monochromatic wave. So if we define that seminorm, which is going to be the limit of the L2 norm on growing uh, balls, uh, sometimes that's called Morey Campanato seminorm. Um, uh, there is a theorem that goes back to Agmon and Kormander that says that <clears throat> that uh, seminorm is uh, finite if and only if our monochromatic wave is the Fourier transform of an L2 density on the sphere. And in fact, that decay is SAR because the seminorm and the L2 norm on the sphere are equivalent. Uh, um, I, I have a small question. Yeah. If, if possible. So uh, in, in Nazar of Sweden, weren't they uh, fixing the degree of spherical harmonics? No, because if you take sum of ID from one to infinity, you will probably get a distribution. No, I mean, uh, yeah. So did um, because Nazar of Sweden would be at least on the sphere, it would be uh, uh, letting the degree go to infinity, and then you would sum the ID. Uh, yeah, choose so, a basis yeah. and, and do that. Yeah. So there are like um, Nazar of Sweden first work was on the sphere, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but later they proved like a. Uh, and was about spherical harmonics and the exponential concentration of the nodal set. But uh, later they developed like a more general approach. Mm -hmm. And for that approach, uh, the, um, eventually they, they want to say things uh, on manifolds. But first you need to say something on the Euclidean space. So okay. that, that result is about the Euclidean space, not about uh, manifolds. But in manifolds you take uh, spherical harmonics that has a fixed eigenvalue, for instance. But yeah, yeah. Here... But, but also uh, uh, like a small remark that uh, when you uh, let the variance decay uh, together with eigenvalue, uh, this is a fairly classical result that about the you know almost sure almost surely in which sublet space you are. Uh, it it uh, appeared in the theory of uh, minimal surfaces. And we later used it also with like Wigman and Kanzani and, and other people. Uh, and, and that has been developed for manifolds. There's not that much difference between manifolds and this. I can give you references if you like. Okay, okay. Maybe we it's, can't. It's, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah. Frank Morgan was, was the person who, who developed, you know, the almost sure uh, Sobolev. So, so there are some, 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 some classical results. Okay. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. Um, so, well, why is that important? Because um, in that decay of the function, in, for instance, in fluid uh, dynamics or fluid mechanics, that L2 function is going to be the kinetic energy. So sometimes it's important to control the, the energy or uh, that waves in scattering theory are called Herglot waves and they are very important the ones with that decay, that finite seminar. So, um, so from there, we can derive properties of the uh, decay properties of the monochromatic wave and uh, depending on the sobolev space that our distribution on the sphere is. But I I'm not going to write them here, but uh, for Nathar of Swing theory, uh, what 
they basically mean is that the function is uh, bounded on on average they are not going to be uh, the not that seminar is not going to be finite but they are going to be bounded on average in the sense that that average integral is is finite so we can think about what's the effect of that regularity on the sphere on the null asset what are the the differences so on the left we can see the nodal set of a monochromatic wave of a random monochromatic wave that looks completely different to the picture on the right which is the nodal set of a monochromatic wave with a smooth density on the sphere even that we can ask like several questions or uh, some motivation uh, can we understand uh, deterministically uh, probabilistically what happens if the density on the sphere is smooth enough? And um, we are going to understand that and we are going to see that the behavior is completely different. So uh, can we say something about what happens in between the Nazar of Sodin case and the uh, smooth case? Or even can we say something about what happens uh, in the less regular case than Nazar of Sodin? <clears throat> and also, there is a, a Nathar of Sodin theory predicts the existence of uh, very exotic functions with the volumetric growth of the diffeomorphism classes and uh, of the null set. So, but the proof is non-constructive. So, can we give a particular example satisfying Nathar of Sodin? So, we are going to try to solve uh, that uh, questions here. So the first of all is the what happens if the density on the sphere is smooth enough. So um, that means that the variances uh, decay fast enough. Um, and that's like the exact condition. But if we think uh, of the variances sigma L as before, as L to the power of minus S, what that condition means is that S is greater than the dimension plus two. In that case, what we can say is that, uh, well, the function is going to be in that solid space, but uh, the behavior of the null set is going to be completely different. On the plane, the, we are going to have a linear growth instead of a volumetric growth of here, uh, the, um, r to the power of two, we are going to have a linear growth. And we are going to, and that uh, growth, uh, we know the, the constant is one divided by pi. But uh, more interesting, if we go to higher dimensions, we are going to have like two different regimes. Uh, with posit on the one hand, with positive probability, we're going to have the same linear growth of uh, the connected component and with the same constant. But on the other hand, also with positive probability, we are going to have that the number of connected components is, is bounded. Um, in fact, there is like a huge uh, connected uh, non-compact component that I'm going to talk a little bit now. We can say something about the diffeomorphism classes. Now, um, when the growth is linear, there is only going to be a sphere. So deformation, something that's, that's diffeomorphic to a sphere. The other diffeomorphism classes like solid torus, genus two, that they are going to be bounded. Only spheres appear. So the behavior is completely different. It's more uh, rigid and not so exotic. So what's the idea of the proof? Well, the idea is to derive uh, like a, uh, um, asymptotic expansion, which can be done using the properties of Bessel functions of spherical harmonics, so the critical um, phase method. Um, there are like two situa situations where we derive that, that the monochromatic wave behaves like some exponential and the function on the sphere. So if the function of the sphere does not vanish, then we are going to have a uh, a linear growth. They are going. The nodal set is going to be like deformations of spheres, like layers. But if the uh, 
function vanishes, then what we are what we are going to have is that the nodal set on the sphere projects on the whole space and that connects all the layers, something like this fig the figure here, like the purple uh, nodal set. We have like layers and then the uh, zeros on the sphere project on the whole space and they connect all the layers. And the connection is um, regular because it's like an helicoid. One. And then um, that's for the approximated function for the asymptotic expression. Then we need to ensure that if we modify in that perturbation is not going to change the normal set of the exact function. So we need a, a non-compact version of Tom isotopy theorem. And then we use probability techniques to say that uh, that probability is one or positive or less than one, etc. Well, can't you remind what is the difference between this situation and the Nazarov and Sodium situation? For the proof or? No, no, formulation. Yeah. Condition, the condition, no? Uh, here the variances decay fast enough. In Nazarov Sodium, the variances are equal to one. They are constant. Your solution are more, more smooth or what does it mean? Yeah, and that means that the function on the sphere is uh, smoother now. Mm -hmm, exactly. in, Nathar, in Nathar also in theory, actually you can prove that, uh, as, as I said before, that the function, the distributions on the sphere are in a negative solid space. But here we require that they are in a positive solid space and positive well, enough. Well, and you can stop me if you don't understand. It, so I'm okay with that. Uh, yes. Also, what we can prove is that if we modify the random variables, uh, that perturbations are not going to change the result. So we can, maybe we can have like non-Gaussian coefficients or if they are Gaussian with different means, different variances, as long as we have, they are close in that sense of that uh, series uh, being finite, the result is going to still hold. And the same with natural sewing. If we modify the random variables and uh, nothing is gonna, the result uh, still still hold. And the proof of that is based on Kakutani's dichotomy theorem of probability. Okay, so that's like the first question. So now we are trying uh, to understand what happens in the other regimes. So for that, uh, what we can try to understand uh, what happens with critical points. Critical points are interesting, but they are also easier to analyze because they are local. Um, also, they, they give us information about the nodal set because for each uh, nodal domain, a nodal domain is a connected component of the set where the function is strictly positive or negative. There is, for each nodal domain, there is a critical point because there is a maximum or a minimum, as we can see in the in this picture. Um, so they give us an upper bound, but as you can see that upper bound, well, uh, for a nodal domain, there can be a lot of critical points. Um, so if we understand the behavior of critical points, we are going to be able to say something about what happens in between the Nazar of sodium case and the smooth enough case. And also they can, we can say something about what happens if we have less regularity than Nazar of sodium. And that is interesting in itself because uh, for critical points, there is no Faber-Crown inequality. Uh, and the Faber-Crown inequality here implies that uh, nodal domains have a minimum volume, so they cannot grow if, uh, the, this bound of the uh, quadratic uh, growth with the radius. But uh, critical points are not uh, bounded uh, a priori. And in fact, uh, we can construct solutions to the Henkel equation that have that um, have as many critical points as we want. If we fix a continuous function, positive, um, for the exponential of the exponential, there exists a solution to the Henkel equation with at least that number of critical points 
uh, in growing bulbs. Um, so that's like um, that regime is also interesting in itself. What we did was to compute the expected value of the number of critical points in a ball of radius R. And we did that for the whole range of the parameter S, that for any, for any real S, and knowing uh, what happens um, with the constant. But more graphically, um, what we prove is that asymptotically, the expected value of the number of critical points in a ball of radius R is going to behave like a, a constant, kappa, um, depending on S, and then uh, R to some exponent also depending on S. And if, <clears throat> if our exponent is, if, our, if S is small enough, the exponent is going to be two, as in nothing of so in theory. But if the exponent is large enough, then the, if the S is large enough, the exponent is going to be one, like in the smooth uh, regime that I showed before. But in between, we are going to have like a linear interpolation and all of the exponents between one and two can be achieved. Um, at the end points, there are going to be like logarithm effects. For instance, if S equals uh, three divided by two, is not going to be exactly R squared, but R squared divided by the square root of the logarithm of R. And something similar happens if at the other end point, five divided by two, we have uh, also a logarithm. Um, that's for the exponent and for the constant, we know uh, as we can see there, that the maximum is attained in the natural of sodium situation. The maximum number of growth for the critical points is attained in the natural of sodium case. And in fact, um, we can also see that that constant goes to zero when S go to minus infinity, which means that even we if we have less regularity, the, the constant goes to zero, which is something a little bit surprising because the solutions with um, that we constructed with a lot of critical points, they are not uh, very regular. So that's something interesting. Uh, well, what's the idea of the proof? Well, obviously to use Kakrai's formula, but here there is a, a problem that if you start using Kakrai's formula, which is the standard way to compute expected values, of critical points or nodal length, there are going to be series like that of Bessel functions. Um, well, if we are in the natural of sodium case in S equal to zero, then we can use Hegenbauer's eighth theorem or for the plane graphs addition theorem. Um, that reduces the problem to computing derivatives of a single Bessel function. But for a general S, there is no exact formula for that series. And there, is, there, is also, there were no asymptotics. So first we, need, we needed to compute the asymptotics. Um, yeah, that's what we did first to compute the asymptotics of that uh, Bessel functions. Um, we can do it for any real S and any integers M and M prime. Um, well, the constant are not written there, but they are explicit. And as you can see in the example, they are nice. There are no numeric symbols. And the same for the other region, we will have logarithmic growth. Um, again, the constants are nice. And what is uh, I S M M M prime? What is what is this function? Is yeah, it's that function that calligraphic J is the series written above. It's a definition. This this series yeah, definition. Yeah, it's a definition. The uh -huh, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a definition. Mm. The, we define that sum as uh, that calligraphic J as the as that series of the product of two Bessel functions. But there is a that uh, L that is a weight that can that complicates things because if there is no L or if S equals zero, then there are standard formulas for that series. 
uh, as I mentioned, graphs, addition theorem, for instance. But so if you... S is a general S, uh, real number, there are no exact formulas, no asymptotics. There were no asymptotics. So what's the idea of, well, the idea of the proof is to use oscillatory techniques, uh, the stationary phase method or something like that. It, and, but the problem is that each region requires a different approach because uh, the frequency can create, uh, the frequency, I mean, the L divided by R can create like some problems, but okay. Uh, I'm not going to enter here. In that. Um, what we can also do is to apply the same methods uh, that we use in the previous paper for critical points and uh, trying to understand if we have uh, enough regularity, what happens with critical points. And to understand that not just in expectation, but to understand that uh, with probability one, what happens uh, with probability one. So the behavior, as we can see, is similar. If S is large enough, which means if we have enough regularity, um, we are going to have a linear growth of the critical points. But the main difference now is that um, now it's not a uh, constant like before. Before it was one divided by pi, but now it's, uh, it's a random variable because it depends on the number of critical points of the modulus of the function on the sphere, um, which is a random variable, um, of course. Um, so the idea is the same as in the previous question or in the previous uh, work, but now the problem is that the modulus of that uh, complex function is not Gaussian and that creates a lot of problems because when things are Gaussian, everything is nice, but non-Gaussianity uh, introduces some problems for if you try to apply some standard technical tools like Bulinskaya lemma. So that's the main difference. Sorry, and what is the space dimension? Uh, for the plane. That, for the plane? Yeah, I didn't okay. mention that, yeah, but well, yeah. Um, here we are working on the always on the plane. Uh, mm, thank you. At, yeah, uh, yeah. I should have said that more specific. Mm. Uh, these results are only for the plane. We are we uh, consider the plane basically because it's simpler. The computations are simpler. There are no um, particular problems that we cannot solve, but the computations, if you go to a general dimensions are going, CAC rise is going to become, become very bold and very difficult to analyze. Uh, but there are no particular, it's just for simplicity. We did that case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, the last question is about finding deterministic uh, realizations for the nodal domains and for nodal bodies. Um, for that, and um, this is related uh, to the first question that um, we had uh, about Nazareth of solving theory of manifolds. So the random wave model of Berry, <clears throat> well, first we start with uh, the standard definition of a Riemannian manifold uh, compact um, with the autonomous basis of eigenfunctions of the Laplacian uh, and the sequence of eigenvalues. Um, there, uh, following the random wave model and also Nazarov's Sodin theory, uh, what Nazarov and Sodin proved is that the number of connected components of, of that set, which they are called nodal domains, as I said before, that number typically use path to behave uh, in that way. That grows with the eigenvalue and there is a constant as before, that's called the Nazar of Sodin constant. And that's what, and that was the, uh, the main uh, goal of Nazar of Sodin, um, to prove that kind of results of manifolds. But as I said before, 
uh, to, to do that, they prove something first on the Euclidean space. And that's what I mentioned at, at the beginning. And also if you, with the random wave model and characterized formula, you can prove something similar for the nodal volume. Uh, well, of course, the nodal volume is the house of measure, measure of the nodal set. And you have that behavior that obviously it agrees with Joe's conjecture. <clears throat> so Bougain had a really smart idea on how to construct solutions having that typical behavior. He found specific examples of functions. He did it on the two dimensional torus of functions satisfying the natural of uh, asymptotic uh, law. Uh, we want to apply that same methods to the Euclidean space. And the rationale for that is that we can see the high energy limit, which means the high uh, eigenvalues as are going to infinity because if we rescale our function uh, in, and to a unit ball, then R square plays the role of the eigenvalue. So that's the uh, one idea that says that maybe you can apply a Bourguin's technique, which is called the randomization to the Euclidean space. And also Bourguin didn't do that for the nodal volume, but maybe it's interesting to, to see if you can apply the same technique to say something similar to the nodal volume. But, but there are some problems. Um, the first is that we are especially interested in higher dimensions. Um, and there, you cannot bound uh, the diameter of a nodal domain with the nodal length, because you can have uh, like long and narrow nodal domains, nodal nodal domains that are going to, um, that can have like a large diameter, but very, very small and nodal volume. So to deal with that, we need a recent techniques so of Chani Yologunov, Malinikova, um, Mangubi. And also there is a problem for nodal volume because there is no fabric inequality. And so the nodal volume is uh, unbounded in general. Uh, sorry, I have a question. So for the first part, do we actually have such nodal domains or we just don't know how to? Yeah, I mean, they can uh, see. Theoretically, they can, but I don't think we can. Well, uh, we cannot exclude them. Yeah, yeah but that's what I'm saying. So sometimes mm. we actually have that, but we yeah. just need to. Ooh, to discard that event. Discard. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, in principle, we believe that they don't. Ah, okay. Yeah. 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 But yeah, we have to discard them in, in some way. So we need to. Yeah, and in fact, we are going to use the Dublin index again, so, as in the, and for the nodal volume. We, yeah, it's not very well written. It's not the system, but the possible existence of, mm -hmm. of that, yeah. Um, yeah, and for the nodal volume, um, the, there is a the problem that it's unbounded. So we need to use the Dublin index, but specifically we need to understand the probabilistic distribution of the Dublin index. We need to control the, the probability tail or the distribution tail of the Dublin index. And also there is, uh, if you go to higher dimensions, then the diffeomorphism types are, it's no longer just the uh, circle, but you have uh, more, more things. So uh, to deal with that, we developed, uh, we didn't follow, um, Bourguin's or Wigman or Kulber approach, but we use a new approach based on weak convergence of probability measures on C spaces and Thomas isotopy theorem that I mentioned earlier. Um, in fact, this new method, a method allows, allows us to solve previous conjectures or better open question that uh, were raised by Kulber and, and Wigman. What is Tom's isotopy theorem? It's uh, a theorem that I mentioned before, but it bas basically allows you to control the nodal set. Like if you have a function uh, that has some nodal set, you can prove that if there is a 
small enough perturbation of that function, then the nodal set is going to be in the same diffeomorphism class that the original function, something like that. Um, previously, we needed a uh, Tom isotopy theorem. The original theorem is uh, for compact components, but in the first quest question I mentioned, we need a uh, non-compact because we have a huge non-compact connected component. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just want to ask the Kuhlberg and Wigman conjectures that are about Dorian? No, they were about uh, the Euclidean space. They had, uh, yeah, because uh, they raised several questions uh, in that paper and they talked about uh, um, plane waves uh, on the Euclidean space and they also talk about arithmetic waves. But here I, I am talking about the questions on the uh, Euclidean space. Yeah, I'm not going to say what's exactly the question uh, because it's a bit uh, technical. But mm -hmm. So uh, what are the functions that we are going to use? Um, the functions are going to we start with a sequence of points on the sphere that they are going to be rationally independent and they are not contained in a hyperplane. That's a technical condition. And in fact, in the paper, we show how to construct that kind of sequence. And then our monochromatic wave is going to be a, a, a combination of some coefficients and exponential. And while the coefficients must be chosen such that uh, the, uh, the monochromatic wave is real. But, okay. Um, then uh, we prove like a general result uh, for not for general methods, but here uh, we should understand that that point, that set of points, equidistribute so that uh, they the measure that I'm talking about here, mu, is going to be the Lebesgue measure on the sphere, right? So the idea is that that set of, set of points are going to be equidistributed. So they are going to, that deltas are going to converge to the um, standard Lebesgue measure on the sphere. And it's also interesting to note that we are taking a linear combination of deltas. The Fourier transform of that monochromatic wave is a linear combination of deltas, which is exactly what one can uh, predict about the Sobolev space that Nazarov sodium fusion on the spheres are. So, well, to state the main result, uh, just a little bit of notation. Here, calligraphic N, depending on U, calligraphic S, and R, is the number of connected components of U in the ball of radius R and that they are in some um, equivalence class of calligraphic S. And what's calligraphic S? Calligraphic S is a subset of the set of diffeomorphism types. We have all the diffeomorphism types, but we take only a subset of them. For instance, we can say that if S is the sphere and the solid torus, then we are only counting the connected components that are diffeomorphic either to a sphere or a solid torus. And obviously, if S has only one element, we recover the sarna wigman case. And if S has all the elements, then we are in the nazarov sodin case that I mentioned at the beginning of the, of the talk. And again, uh, that uh, our random field is going to be the one determined by the Lebesgue mesa on the sphere. So we are going to be talking about monochromatic random waves. But in general, we can say something about other fields. That's why it appears there. So what we prove, and this is a joint work with Andrea Sartori, more or less we can attain the Nazarov sodium constant. But to uh, unravel it uh, a little bit, what it says, what that theorem says, is that given some epsilon, um, U is a large enough N, that is the number of points uh, on the sphere. And then given that epsilon at, and that N, with, if you take the radius large enough, 
then you are going to approximate to the number of sodium constant. As Sorry, what as is N, N capital? What is N capital? N is the number of points of the... Ah, uh -huh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, N is the number of points that... Uh, the number of combinations of exponentials. And the number of points, because uh, they are points on the, on the sphere. Thank so you. If, you, if you take enough points, and then you take the radius large enough, you are going to approximate as close as you want to the number of sodium constant. But uh, we cannot prove that uh, that um, a solution is going to have the number of sodium constant. Um, well, it's an interesting question. Um, maybe in the question time we can talk about it. But uh, because if you could swap limits, then you will have nothing of sodium constant. If you take first the limit on n, then you will have nothing of sodium constant. But maybe in the question time, we can talk about why the proof doesn't work and why that limit uh, wouldn't work also, even if the proof works, but it's not going to work. Um, Sorry, and, and what uh, is m? m in the previous formula, what is m? Yeah, m is the... M, m. Yeah. The dimension. Here, no, no, just I, the, M is the M in the previous one. There was M. M. Michael. What is M? The dimension of the Euclidean space. Ah, dimension. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, here uh, we are um, considering uh, R M our Euclidean space. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm not using N because N is for the points. Yeah. But here, yes, it's true. Uh, M is the dimension of the Euclidean space. We are in Rm. For dimensions greater than two, we can. And as I was saying, we can prove like similar things for the nodal length. Uh, could be in accordance if we rescale, as I said before, that would be in accordance with an analogy of Joust conjecture for the Euclidean space. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, just a, a little bit about how the proof works. So the first element that we need is what is called semi-locality. That if you want to count the number of connected components, what you do first is to count them on smaller balls and then integrate. That's the idea of semi-locality. And as I said, uh, the problem uh, for higher dimensions is that uh, you need to control the doubling index to discard these noodle nodal domains. And the, the basic idea then is that that average integral looks like an expected value. And that looks like an expected value if you define capital U as the monochromatic wave centered at X and then Y is the variable. And it's like an expected value if X is uniformly distributed in the ball of radius R. And now X plays the role of the random parameter. And once you, ho you have that, uh, what you can uh, prove, and that's what Bourguin's idea, is that that field is going to be like, um, it's going to be Gaussian. And what this theorem says, is that that field is going to converge in distribution to the monochromatic random waves. Okay, and you can also prove that you have Gaussian moments, so you expect Gaussianity. And once you have Gaussianity, then uh, you can apply, uh, as I said before, that um, you can apply the continuous mapping theorem to say that the nodal counts are going to converge in distribution. Um, then we use standard result like Pomanto theorem to say that the expected values are going to convert in distribution. And Sorry, in what is U, UX? What is this field, UX? UX is what I defined here. Capital UX is oh. the new field that is going to, um, to approximate the monochromatic random waves. But mm. now uh, the idea is that X plays the role of the 
random parameter and x mm. is uniformly distributed in the ball of radius r mm. and uh, thank you i have another question uh, uh, so suppose you know something about the rate of uniform distribution of points on the sphere right uh, of the points rn uh, can you say something about the rate of convergence for this result uh, for the nodal uh, the main number of the mains and, and the no we don't like yeah in the proof uh, we don't have like sharp estimates of the yeah they are in fact really bad so we cannot control the rate of convergence Mm -hmm. But but do you expect uh, to uh, th that rate to somehow depend on how well the points are distributed on the sphere, or this is yeah that it yeah it well let, I will talk um, yeah so for instance if you go here you have like uh, different set of of points, right? That's for the plane. We are considering the same waves that I was uh, talking about. And now you have 25 points and 100 of points that they are uh, more or less uh, equidistributed, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if they approach too fast to the uh, uniform distribution, you are not going to have, you are, that's going to be worse because the nodal set is not going to look like it should look because isn't, you should expect something like the picture on the left that you have a quadratic growth of the number of nodal domains. But if the points equidistribute too fast, at least for the near the origin, they are going, <laughs> they are going to behave like, um, like, uh, like a linear regime that I talk about. So, but that's for the origin. You don't, you don't know what's going to happen uh, at infinity. But in any case, the proof uh, doesn't work. So you don't know. Well, the, the proof doesn't give you a rate of convergence. But, and you, don't, you cannot know that uh, what's going to happen at, at infinity. Maybe it gets better uh, with uh, if they distribute very well, or maybe you they resemble like a uniform distribution. And if they are like a uniform distribution, they uh, you don't expect the behavior of nothing of sodium, but the behavior of the smooth case. So you cannot say that that's going to be better. Thank you. Uh, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. So that's like, uh, with that, uh, as, uh, as I was saying, that's like the idea of the proof. You prove convergence in distribution, then that allows you to approximate expected values and then you have the proof. And just to end, for the nodal length, it's basically the same, but you cannot apply for Mantua theorem. So you need to understand the Dublin index again, probabilistically, and you need to prove uniform integrability, which is a technical result in him. Thank you, Alvaro. Are there any questions for the speaker? Yeah. Let me ask a question about the, uh, sort of what kind of bound you get on this? You said that you have some uh, bound on the average behavior of the double index. So what, what, what exactly do you prove? So what we prove that um, um, the Dublin index for that capital U is average, uh, if you do an average integral of the Dublin index, mm -hmm. you are, um, that's going to be bounded uh, depending on the, with an error depending on the radius, something so like that. So bound will be like a constant? Uh, well, not necessarily. But what do we control? You need to, that, that doesn't grow uh, like really fast. No, but that's my question. Yeah, oh. yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the exact details, uh, I don't recall right now, but would, would you prove, actually, would we prove the probability that the Dublin index is 
too large is greater than a parameter beta, uh, the case fast enough. I don't remember like the sub. Yeah, there is a, a first of all, doubling index is always bounded by square root of lambda, right? So that's mm -hmm. the law of all forms. Yeah. But then there is a uh, uh, following uh, idea that I think was first uh, put forward in the paper by uh, Lazar Sodin and uh, my brother Lenny. So, where they basically showed that uh, Yao's conjecture in dimension is equivalent to the statement that on average, on small balls, on balls of, let's say, uh, set of one hours per of lambda, the doubling index is bound. Mm -hmm. okay. so from yeah. this, and that could imply Yao's conjecture. Yeah, I don't think we have proved Yao's conjecture, but yeah. I... no, I that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't um, recall like the exact details, but we we proved like a, a bound on the tail, and I don't know. But also, I guess in your case, you are not averaging over balls, but you are rather averaging over. Uh, yeah, over like, the uh, inside yeah. inside the ball. You said, sorry, you use the dynamic factor method? Because the dynamic factor might have something yeah. in the middle of the index, as I say, you, know, you divide into cubes and not on half the cubes you have uniformly bounded mm -hmm. up against this. So yeah. you use something like that? Or, or? Yeah, with, uh, I'll like, uh, Donnelly Pfefferman, we use the result, the standard result that you can control the nodal length with the doubling index. Okay, and to, on yeah, that. and on a ball. Yeah. Um, uh, then, and we also, I was going to, we use like Nazarov Turan lemma to, we can control the Dublin index and say, we can prove that basically the Dublin index is less than N. N is the number of points. And that's with uh, Nazarov uh, Turan lemma, with, because we have a sum of exponentials, um, mm -hmm. which is the equivalent of, of what uh, Joseph said before. Mm -hmm. But for the, a clean space, we need that result of Nazarov Antoran. Sorry, can't you comment the picture in which there was a nodal set for 25 and for 100 points, and the first was much more random, and the second it was rather regular? You know, yes, yeah. yeah, the picture, yes, this, this one. The, the second is regular and the left is random. Why? On the left, we the first thing is that we are looking at something near the origin, right? So, well, first of all, these uh, pictures where uh, if someone asks something about what I said that we cannot swap limits, but uh, uh, with that, uh, here for the first, we have 25 points and that looks uh, like something random, but on the right, what you see is that the nodal domains start to merge and form like rings. Um, the, um, the point of, of that and the rationale for that is that if in that function, that is like the functions that we considered before, but for the plane. So instead of writing exponentials, we can write uh, a cosine and uh, an assign. So, uh, the idea there is that if you take a lot of points and in fact, in the limit, that kind of functions are going to be like, uh, are going to converge to the Bessel function. They are going to, because here at the beginning, if I take a lot of functions and instead of a square root of two N, I have two N, because that's not going to modify the nodal domain, it's a positive factor, that thing is going to converge to, the, to an integral. To the integral, if you take, for instance, the coefficients, all coefficients are equal to one, not just the modulus, but they are equal to one, then that sum is going to go to the integral of the exponential over the sphere. And that's mm -hmm. uh, a Bessel function. Um, that is radial. So that's exactly what you see here. That if you take a lot of points and in the limit, they are going to behave like uh, spherical. 
like spherical vessel functions. So they are radial. So the limit, the growth is linear. And that's related to our first question that if the coefficients are smooth enough in the limit, they are going to be the Fourier transform or of a smooth density on the sphere. So you don't expect nothing of sodium theory to apply. And in fact, you are going to have uh, what we prove of a linear regime or even that the connected components are bounded. So that is the problem that you cannot take the limit of the number of points first, because if you do that, you are not going to have the natural sodium growth. And that's why it doesn't look random because on the origin, they look like spherical vessel functions and vessel functions, are, uh, the growth is linear. Mm. Thank you. In the Nazarov sudden regime, so what's known about the constants in that case? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, they are, there are numerics about the constant and more or less for the plane, you know uh, the value, but they are numerical. There are um, upper bounds and upper bounds given by critical points, the number of critical points, the expected value of critical points, like for instance, this constant here is an upper bound. Uh, the natural of sodium, the kappa, if you divide by five, because that's for the representation, but kappa for S equal to zero is an upper bound of the natural of sodium constant because it's the number of critical points is greater than mm -hmm. the, um, in fact, um, there are also using cap rise, you can prove better bounds. Uh, instead of looking at critical points, you look uh, uh, when the nodal domain, the tangent vector um, is parallel to some vector. There are uh, other ways to prove upper bounds that are better. Um, for low, and that all of this for the plane, uh, there are also lower bounds that they were proved uh, explicitly. They are non numerics, and this is a work of. Uh, Alejandro Rivera, Maxine, and Gemo, they proved a lower bound of the natural sodium constant, which is not very good, but it's a lower bound and it's, um, it's something to the exponent of minus a large number. So it's not a very good uh, spon uh, lower bound, uh, as they say, but it's a, a, a mathematical. A lower bound. So you know lower bounds, upper bounds given by Kakrais, and you know more or less the numerics. Uh, That's for the, the global count, or so yeah, what happens global. if you uh, focus on the a, a fixed different morphism type? Well, that that would be for higher dimensions and in higher dimensions. Yeah, I think it works on numerics. Yeah, maybe. So the, the, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, but I don't know if, that's, if that was for the plane or for higher dimensions, I don't know. But for, for sure, that was for the plane, yeah. For the plane, more or less, you know. I mean, there was something in, in dimension three where they looked at different surfaces that could be generic. Mm -hmm. Dependence on the, the genus. Yes. It was one of one the sphere. Yeah, actually in, yeah, in Sarnak and Wickman's paper, there are some numerics, yeah, for um, um, yeah, depending on betting numbers, but they they don't they also study um, not just monochromatic waves, but uh, what's called um, band limited functions and uh, Fubini study metric. It's like it's not necessarily uh, for monochromatic waves, but they have some numerics. Yes. Simple question. Can you go back to the pictures of 25 and uh, so it's, uh, uh, I mean, correct in saying that, like, essentially, your result is saying that, like, as, as, as your n increases, uh, then uh, you form this, uh, you form uh, these rings with high probability, something like that. Like, the nodal components merge into these rings with high probability. There is that not a right interpretation. Well, actually, the theorem doesn't, um, it's a little bit counterintuitive because the, lim the theorem says that if n is large enough, mm -hmm. then you are going to be 
uh, closer to the Nazar of sodium constant. Right. But the problem is that you have to take the radius that you start depends on n. So right. the theorem doesn't say you expect it's just the opposite that if you increase n, then you are closest to Nazar of sodium theory. Mm -hmm. So you that's like a weird behavior. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that what probably happens is that if you take n large enough, then you have to take after that the radius large enough, uh, much, much larger. So what happens at the origin doesn't matter. But that prevents you from taking uh, the limit of n first, because if you do that, obviously the proof doesn't work because the error terms blow up, but the also mm, that's not going to work. Uh, the result uh, is false. If, for some functions, at least if you take, if, then, you, swap the if you swap the limit, the result is going to be false, at least for a lot of funds. Sorry, can't you reach on to the picture about the asymptotics, K of S and C of S? The we saw it just before this. Uh, yes, a K of S and C of the asymptotics, I say, yeah. How it is possible that for S is larger than three half, three halves, K of S is zero. No. But what is this? What yeah. does it, what does it mean? No. What is yeah. the asymptotic? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it, for, S larger than three halves, uh, kappa is not uh, plotted there. Yeah, that's uh, a good point. That, kappa uh, is kappa, kappa is with, no kappa is a positive constant there, but yeah. uh, I haven't plotted uh, because it's it the plot gets too messy and so here the plot for kappa is only when the exponent is uh, uh, less than three halves. Mm -hmm. For other regions in our paper, we have plots, but uh, for instance, the region between three halves and five halves is very small and you cannot plot something properly there. And in fact, kappa is too large, so we'll cut the red plot. So it's not included there, but that's for visualization, for the sake of simplicity. But you can no the the constant is positive, and in fact, well, yeah, it's positive. It cannot go to zero because uh, mm. it's an upper bound of the number of critical points. So yeah, you are right. Um, no, but it's not plotted there. Can you show the uh, formula for uh, for this uh, symptotic before before there's a formula? Yes, before oh yes, uh, yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, so k of s is. Positive anyhow, of course, yes, I see. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Thank you. Mm. Are there thank any you. other questions or comments? Oh. Okay, let's thank Alvaro again.